It was two years ago this week when Jimmy Hoffa disappeared from a Detroit restaurant parking lot. He is assumed to have been murdered, though the body has never been found. Well, now NBC News learns the FBI is investigating leads that tie Hoffa's disappearance to the present leadership of the Teamster Union and leads suggesting the union leadership paid off the Nixon administration to keep Hoffa out of union power. Our man Brian Ross has been on the Hoffa story since the beginning and he has put together the following report. December 23rd, 1971. This was the day Jimmy Hoffa was waiting for, the day President Nixon commuted his sentence. Hoffa was free after four years in a federal prison and eager to get back in power in the nation's biggest and wealthiest union, the Teamsters. What restrictions are you under? At this moment, none. But what Hoffa apparently did not know was that there was a restriction. A deal had been made. Written into his release from prison was a provision that he could not return to power in the Teamsters. And he never did. He went to court to fight the restriction, and he was still fighting it when he disappeared. Now, that restriction in Hoffa's prison release has become an important part of the government's investigation into Hoffa's disappearance. The questions being asked are, who arranged with the Nixon administration that Hoffa's release be written to keep him out of the Teamsters? And are they the same people who later arranged for Hoffa's disappearance? NBC News has learned that the FBI has information that organized crime figures and Teamster officers paid more than a quarter million dollars in two separate payments to members of the Nixon administration to make sure that Hoffa was kept out of the Teamsters when he got out of prison. Sources close to the investigation say former presidential assistant Charles Colson was questioned this year about his role in arranging Hoffa's release. Colson denies he was questioned. The FBI is also interested in questioning H.R. Haldeman, Nixon's former chief of staff. Haldeman is in a federal prison and could not be reached for comment. And the FBI also wants to talk with former White House counsel John Dean. Dean says the idea of keeping Hoffa out of the Teamsters came from then Attorney General John Mitchell, who Dean says showed an unusual interest in the terms of Hoffa's release. The first mention of a condition that Hoffa would not participate in Teamster Union activities came to you from Mitchell. It came to me from Mitchell that he had some understanding. I, I Wasn't don't... something you thought up then? Oh, no, no, no. I thought up the idea while I was being a good staff man and telling him how he could write this into the pardon after he told me he had this general understanding. But the idea of putting a restriction on Hoffa's participation in the Teamsters once he was out was Mitchell's idea. You know, I couldn't care less, frankly, uh, which way it went uh, and wasn't really tuned into the politics of it at the time, so it uh, didn't make any difference to me. I was just telling Mitchell what he could do legally. Dean says Mitchell told him the understanding was with Hoffa's lawyer, but Hoffa later denied that was the case. Mitchell has testified that he had a number of conversations about Hoffa's release with Teamster President Frank Fitzsimmons, Hoffa's rival. Mitchell is now in federal prison and could not be reached for comment. So far, Richard Nixon has not been questioned in the Hoffa case, but federal investigators say Nixon's testimony and that of his former aides could be important in solving the Hoffa case. Philip Van Dam, the United States Attorney in Detroit. Have you questioned uh, members of the Nixon administration about this? Uh, there have been some former uh, government officials, uh, former Nixon administration uh, people uh, that uh, we've talked with, I think, uh, uh, once uh, one gets into uh, specific names, however, um, uh, something I don't want to do. But you're asking former members of the Nixon administration their whereabouts in certain days. Did they receive money? That may be, well, that, I, I think what we're asking uh, at this point is uh, what, if anything, do they know about the circumstances surrounding uh, uh, the pardon? Federal investigators also want to question Teamster President Fitzsimmons about the arrangement to keep Hoffa out of the Union and about Hoffa's disappearance. But Justice Department officials in the Ford administration twice stopped investigators from calling Fitzsimmons before a federal grand jury. Investigators are asking the Carter administration if it's now all right to call Fitzsimmons as well as the former Nixon White House aides before the grand jury. The people working on the Hoffa case say that if the administration permits them to pursue the leads they have, they can show that Hoffa was murdered by his Teamster rivals. Their theory is that the same Teamster rivals who saw to it that the terms of Hoffa's prison release kept him out of the Teamster leadership 
also had the motive to kill him. Brian Ross, NBC News. O'Brien says he's been through a lot during the last week, but he's prepared to handle that and live life as normally as possible. He is, however, concerned about the safety of his wife and children, and also that of Jimmy Hoffa. Nancy Herr, ABC News in West Memphis, Arkansas. Do you read it? Have it. Uh, do you want, I'll read the whole affidavit. <clears throat> yes. Um, Thomas A. Boland, being duly sworn, says, I am co-counsel for defendant Roy M. Cohn, and make this affidavit in opposition to the motion of William G. Mulligan, Esquire, to quash a subpoena ducus tecum heretofore served on him in behalf of Mr. Cohn. A copy of the subpoena served upon Mr. Mulligan is attached to him to his moving papers as an exhibit thereto. Essentially, the subpoena calls for documents that which will show the... Mulligan's testimony and the documents he is unable to produce will conclusively demonstrate that prosecution witnesses Garfield and Roan gave or authorized their counsel to give to Life magazine a story quite at variance from the one told by them at this trial. Nine, for example, on page 102 of the Life magazine article, it is alleged that in August 1959 there was a meeting in New York between government witnesses Swan, Garfield, Roan, and Barclay. This statement, along with the entire Life article, was proofread and corrected by Mr. Mulligan prior to publication. Nevertheless, at the prior trial of this indictment, it was consistently denied that Mr. Roan was in New York during the period in question. Ten, defendants should be entitled to utilize Mr. Mulligan's testimony. It was sworn at the time, this copy is a photostat of a carbon, but the original was sworn to by me, and I hereby reaffirm, re-swear that every word in it is true. Now, how about these exhibits that are attached to it? Did you get yeah. those out of life's files yourself? Yes, I got the originals out of life files, photostat them, and put them back in the files. Who is the man Mulligan you refer to in there repeatedly, so I'll be clear on that. Mr. Mulligan was an attorney in New York who represented two of the witnesses against Mr. Cohn at his trial. He was helping Life magazine with this poisonous article against Mr. Cohn before Mr. Cohn came to trial. Now, the... Uh, uh, Do you have those exhibits C, yes, D, sir. and E to which you referred? Yes, sir. Would you read those? Yes, exhibit D is an office memorandum on time stationery to E.K. Thompson from Sidham, S-U-Y-D-A-M, Washington, date March 6, 1961, entitled <clears throat> Personal and Confidential. Last Saturday, I got a phone call from Bob Kennedy asking if I could drop whatever I was doing and come to his office. I did, and when I got there, he closed the door and told me the following. In a back room was a high official of the Teamsters, a man who had been, very, who had been privy to the inner workings of the organization since 1953. He was particularly knowledgeable about Hoffa. This official is honest, said Kennedy, and also quite an idealist. The man had been working directly with Kennedy and in secret for the last two years. He was now so disillusioned and dis disgusted with the corruption he saw all around him, particularly as concerns Hoffa, that he has just about decided to make a public break with the union. Kennedy said he had suggested to this man that he make his break via an article in Life in the form of a personal expose of Hoffa. Kennedy asked my personal word that for the moment only you and I would know of this matter. Kenny, Kennedy feels, perhaps melodramatically, perhaps not, that the man's life would be in danger if word leaked out of his intentions. I told the Attorney General that if you were interested in this man's story, and if we did go ahead, more and more people at life would have to become involved. Kennedy understood this, but pointed out that if we are not interested, then only two people, as he put it, that he personally knows and trusts, will have had to know about it. I gave my word. He also asked that if we do not want to go ahead, or at least look into the possibilities, in other words, when we have to pass the point of only you and I being involved, we let him know first. I said we would. 
At any rate, here's the story as related to me by this fellow after a cloak and dagger shift of scenery involving Kennedy slipping us out through back corridors, a drive by roundabout route to the guy's home in Virginia, and the assigning to me of the code name Brown. <clears throat> Sam Barron is this gentleman's name, a small distinguished man of 58 with flowing white hair and gray mustache. He has been deeply involved in the labor movement or allied liberal causes since 1930. His present title is field director of the warehouse division, a position in the executive hierarchy just below the executive board. Barron came into unionism through Dave Dubinsky's garment workers and right away, he says, he encountered graft. Sam was in the investigative division and he discovered that his own department head was in collusion with New York gangsters. The department head tried to discredit him with the higher brass, but most of them were honest and they backed his desire to prove what he suspected. Despite both threats and bribery attempts, says Sam, he did and his boss and a half dozen other department heads were fired. In a couple of years, Barron became involved with the white collar organization Drives in New York and 1935 saw him president of the bookkeepers, stenographers and accountants union. It was at this juncture that he encountered another in what he describes as a series of major challenges in his life. This one was communism. Barron was a socialist and very much opposed to the communists and especially their spreading influence in the labor movement. He has some stories about clashes he and the commies had which don't add anything to this summary save to make the point which Kennedy stressed to me and which Barron quite modestly conveys that he is both an idealist and a fighter for what he believes in. At any rate, the Spanish Civil War broke out, and in 1937, Sam went over in the dual role of reporter for several labor papers and as official observer for the Socialist Party. He became a friend of Hemingway's, and together, says Barron, they witnessed the growing communist influence in the Loyalist cause and began to feel that many young Americans in Spain were being pathetically caught up in the clash between the communist influence on the one side and, of course, the fascists and the Americans had come to fight. More idealism, more soul searching, brushes with the communists, including an attempt on his life, then in 1939, out of Spain. Four years in New York where he tried his executive hand on a labor relations firm. He was finally hired 1942 by the textile workers. His stint with them lasted until 1953 when Harold Gibbons, with whom he was developing a close friendship, asked him to come into the Teamsters. Barron accepted and has been with them since. Quote, I've been in continuous association with and continuous clash with Jimmy Hoffa ever since the day he went to work, says Sam. One of the first things he ever said to me, perhaps he'd heard that I despised dishonest union officials, was, don't think you're going to stop the boys from making a fast buck because you're not. Barron, who of course hasn't been the first one to do it, calls Hoffa the most dangerous man in America. He says only someone like himself who has seen Hoffa operate from the out inside can fully realize the evil of the man. Says Barron, Hoffa certainly has had as bad publicity as anyone around, but a lot of time it gets balanced off or rationalized with, well, maybe he isn't the most ethical guy around, but he's done a lot for the rank and file teamster. Or he's a pretty ruthless cookie, but personally seems real nice. He doesn't smoke or drink, and he lives in a very modest house, and he's a very devoted family man. These people who say that would have been interested to see Hoffa the day after Visca Rizel was blinded. I think it happened around midnight in New York. Jimmy had an 8 a.m. meeting with some of us in Chicago. Jimmy breezes into the room, makes straight for me, and says, gleefully poking his finger in my chest, hey, Sam, a buddy of yours got it last night. I asked him what he meant, and he said, your buddy Victor Rizal, someone threw acid in his face. The son of a bitch should have had it thrown on the hands he types with, too. Then Hoffa gave a big, I hope they get the bastard that did it. When he hung up, someone asked him since when he had developed all this fast sympathy for Rizal, and Jimmy said, don't be stupid, you know that phone's tapped. Or, quote, or some of his supporters should see the pleasure Jimmy takes in trying to humili humiliate other human beings to enhance his own ego. I was at a conference in his office in Washington not long ago, and one of the people present was Edward Bennett Williams. Hoffa was flipping through some mail, and all of a sudden, in front of everyone, he takes one letter and, without looking up from his desk, throws it on the floor. He said, take care of that, Williams. Some of these people in the organization are totally dependent on Hoffa and have to take that S from him. But Williams just got up, didn't say a word, and just walked out of the room. Another time, right in the middle of a big meeting, when I was disagreeing with him on a point, Hoffa suddenly jumped up from the table when he gets really mad. It's all red in the face, and his eyes glares, and you can see his facial muscles working. Horse, he screams at me, what the F do you know any about anything? You're F-ing square. Barron says he's been able to live with his hate of Hoffa because he believes strongly in the labor movement and what he, Barron, cannot contribute. 
He feels that the Teamsters Union particularly leads honest officials and regards himself as that. He says he believes that Gibbons, though more of a pragmatic operator, is honest and feels the same. He says the reason he thinks Hoffa has never tried to get rid of him is twofold. Barron is Harold Gibbons' boy, and Hoffa badly needs Gibbons. Barron is highly competent and also extremely popular with the rank and file, and Hoffa is acutely aware of this. Jimmy hates my guts. I don't know how many times he's stressed this in front of my colleagues. Time and time again, he said to me in front of them, listen, Baron, you depend on me for your job. I can take it any time I want. Of specifics regarding corruption, Baron says this. I know of so, I know of so much. My God, I'll bet Hoffa has a couple of million dollars stashed away somewhere, but knowing about it, some of these things and proving them is another matter. Now, for instance, I could write for you in detail the mechanics of how his election was rigged. It was rigged so tight what happened in Miami was no more an expression of the rank and file than I don't know what. I don't know how it was rigged. I saw it happen, but I can't prove it. Of course, I don't think he had to rig it. If the rank and file had had a voice, I believe they'd have elected him. 